So inshallah we're continuing with this series of lectures on different misconceptions regarding Islam and last lesson which was the first lesson that we did we talked about atheism and evolution uh, before we begin today's lesson can someone just remind me of something they remember from last lesson something they learned anything they remember or anything they learned from last lesson just to refresh our memory okay the difference between adaption and evolution was the difference Okay, good. Adaption is when you adapt to your environment, so certain parts of the body will evolve or they'll change, they'll adapt to the environments, like the beak becoming bigger or shorter, or the tail becoming smaller, and so on and so forth. So the animal still stays the same. And evolution is when a species evolves into another species, an ape into a human, for example, according to evolutionists, or for example, a fish into a horse, or a a lizard into a, a dog or something like this. And of course, as Muslims, we said that evolution is something which uh, isn't in accordance with Islamic beliefs. Anyone else? Did you have something, brother? Good. We talked about Charles Darwin, who was the person who came up with the idea of evolution and human beings evolving from apes. So he was the, the, the brainchild of this whole idea. But he was actually a Jew. He believed in God, even after he wrote his book, The Origin of the Species. Anyone else? Very good. It's a theory. It's a theory, a scientific theory, which means it's not something which is fact. And also, we said science is based on observation. Like when you did chemistry or physics or biology in school, you look at certain things, you study certain things, you do a test, you do test one, test two, test three, and then you give a prediction about what's going to happen and at the end you have a conclusion. What the results, you know, like what you expected. So all of these things are based on observation. Science is all observation. So evolution is something which hasn't been observed. Why hasn't it been observed? Because it's something which has taken place over millions of years or hundreds and thousands of years so no one's been alive that long but they've actually seen apes turn into, turn into human beings so if it's not something which is based on science because science is something which is based on observation then it's actually something which is that requires faith, it requires faith because people say we just we just uh, believe in it because people who are more knowledgeable than us, people who are uh, you know, smarter than us, people who've written books about these, of these topics, we've read them and we trust them and we believe in what they say. So what's the difference between that and between somebody who believes in Allah and believes in the Qur'an? It's the same, same thing, There's one isn't, well of course Islam is better than the other, but in, in terms of, you know, what you're studying and what you're reading, there is no, it doesn't have an upper hand, science doesn't have an upper hand. So today, inshallah, we're going to be, uh, Carrying on with uh, this series, and today we're going to be talking about religions and ideologies. And in this lesson, we're going to be talking about different religions. And of course, there are so many religions, and there's so many different ideologies and groups and sects in Islam. You know, we're not going to be able to cover this in one lesson. And as uh, one of the brothers who put this idea forward, he suggested that we're going to look at uh, Islam from different angles, from different perspectives. So we're going to look at, for example, Islam from a spiritual perspective, from a legal perspective, from an economical perspective. So how Islam actually is a way of life, it's an ideology, it's a religion, it's something which covers all aspects of our life. It's not just something which is, uh, you know, 
done in a masjid, for example, or something which is read in a book, but it's something which your whole life encompasses it. But before we do that, we, we, we need to look at religion as a whole. And this whole idea of religions and what religions are and where they came from and so on and so forth. So obviously, depending on where you live, there's different religions in different parts of the world. And from those religions, people choose uh, which religion they want to follow or they're brought up in a specific religion and they grow up having a certain type of faith. And when you look at the different types of religions, they all have different beliefs and different views and different faiths, uh, you know, different ideas with regards to faith. And if we were to look at history and we were to ask ourselves, as some people may ask, that the oldest religion that's, that's been around, that exists, must be the one that's the truest. Because some people, they say, if this religion is so old and it's still around up till today, it must be correct, it must be the true religion, because it's been around for such a long time, it's ancient. And so, for example, people come up with, uh, you know, Hinduism, for example, which is very old, or for example, Buddhism, or other religions, which are, you know, very, very old religions. But what's interesting is actually Islam is something which has been around since the beginning of time. Because the whole idea of Islam, the whole message behind Islam, as Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, through the tongues of the different messengers, when they went to their people, Ya qawmi abudullah ma lakum min ilahin ghayru different prophets and messengers are mentioned in the Quran that they went to their people and they said, O oh my people, worship Allah, you have no other God besides Him. So actually this idea of worshipping Allah, worshipping God alone and not associating any partners with Him is actually the oldest religion because it was around from the time of Adam salam, the first man. And Islam is something which didn't start 1400 years ago with the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam But the core principle of Islam of worshipping Allah alone is something which was From the beginning of time So that's something which we need to think about which we need to remember and also When we reflect on the Abrahamic faiths the Abrahamic religions you have the three religions Islam Christianity and Judaism and what's interesting is these religions have similarities and they also they also have differences they have similarities and they also have differences and there are certain moments in history when those religions even though they're from the abrahamic faith meaning they all came from they all believe in ibrahim alayhi salam even though they all come from the same root which is ibrahim alayhi salam whether it's through Ishaq or whether it's through Ismail alayhi salam, they at one point or another veered off the straight path. Obviously this is Christianity and Judaism we're talking about, not Islam, of, of course. So when we reflect on Judaism, for example, we see that uh, initially the whole idea of uh, Judaism and the whole concept of Bani Israel and Musa salam, is something which is in Islam and the message of Musa salam, was to worship Allah alone. And with the Jews where they basically uh, went wrong or where they veered off course was at the birth of Isa salam. So the Jews, they were not Christians of course before Isa salam, was born. And so when Isa salam, was born, the miraculous birth, when his mother Maryam salam, gave birth to him and she was somebody who was a virgin, she gave birth and the Jews, they went to the extreme of accusing Maryam salam, of you know, evil things, of unchaste things. And so they basically 
considered Isa السلام, to be an illegitimate child. So, so this is where the Jews basically went, of course. And also the Christians at this moment in time, there were different groups of the Christians who believed in Isa السلام, as a messenger, as a prophet of Allah. You had one group, you have the group who basically rejected him as a prophet and messenger, who were the Jews. And then you have the Christians, some of whom, they basically took the other extreme. And they said, Isa السلام, is basically God himself. And we'll talk about this whole idea of the Trinity and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and so on and so forth. So they took the other extreme. Okay, they went overboard and they said, this is something amazing. And he must be something divine. Okay, he's more than just a miracle. He must, be, he must have divine attributes. He must be somebody who possesses the qualities of God himself. For this to have taken place. And funnily enough, it's not Maryam السلام, who they say possesses those qualities. Even though she was a mother. But it's, the, it's Isa السلام, the, the son, the one who was born. So they give him these qualities and they raise him eventually to the status of becoming something which was worshipped. And so some of the Christians, they ended up worshipping him. Now some of the Christians, they were basically Muslims. Because obviously in those days, you know, there was no Sharia of the Prophet Muhammad because he came later. So the believers of Allah and the true Muslims at that time were those who understood and realized and recognized that Isa السلام, was a miracle and as he himself said when he was born Inni Abdullahi al-Kitaba wa ja'alani nabiya. Verily I am the slave of Allah and he has given me the book and he has made me a prophet. So this is what Isa السلام, himself said when he was born, when he was a baby. It was a miracle he was given. He was able to speak in the cradle while he was a baby. And so these Christians, they basically were Muslim and they worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they believed in Isa alayhi salam as a prophet and messenger. And as time went on, more and more groups formed. Okay, and eventually those who believed that Isa alayhi salam was a messenger and a prophet and that uh, people should only be worshipping the one true God, they should only be worshipping Allah, these people, their numbers diminished. So they decreased over time. And eventually, uh, the Roman Empire was converted into Christianity. So before the Roman Empire was a Christian empire, what was their religion? Islam. No, Islam came afterwards. The Prophet Muhammad came afterwards. What was their religion? The no. Pagans. Pagans. The Roman gods. The Roman gods. So they were pagans. And around 300 years after the death of Isa around 325 CE, there was uh, an emperor of Rome who was sympathetic to the Christians. So before this, the Romans would persecute the Christians. They would kill them, they would murder them, they would massacre them because they weren't on the same faith as the Roman Empire. They weren't pagans, they were Christians. So they would kill them. And Constantine came in 325, or around that time, and he was sympathetic to the Christians. And eventually, he actually became Christian. So he was the first emperor, Roman emperor, to, be, become, to become a Christian. After this, the whole of the Roman Empire became a Christian empire. And so the Christians basically rejoiced. It's like, you know, Obama becoming Muslim or something. Or Trump. You never know. But it's something similar. So one of the superpowers, one of the greatest people of all time, in terms of power, in terms of strength, politically, okay? Imagine this person becomes a Muslim. It's something which it will change the whole face of, you know, the political state of, of, the, of the world, of the known world. So the Christians rejoiced, the Christians became happy. But there were differences amongst the Christians, starting from the, all the way back when Isa a.s. was actually born, about who Isa a.s. actually was. 
And so what happened was Constantine, he eventually held a meeting in 325, in the year 325, and this meeting he invited and he called all the Christian scholars from all over the Christian world. And he asked these, these scholars, Christian scholars, to come to this meeting. Anyone know what this meeting was called? This council. Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea. And he called this meeting, he called this council because he wanted to once and for all, okay, end any differences that the Christians had about who Jesus was. Whether he was God, whether he was a son, the father, whether he was just a normal human being, whether he was a messenger, so on and so forth. So he convened this meeting, this council, so that they could come to some kind of ijma, unanimous consensus about who Jesus was. In this meeting, and this is actually recorded, it's not something which is a conspiracy or anything, it's actually recorded in history. You can Google Council of Nicaea and it comes up on Wikipedia and so on. In this meeting, in this council, they basically came up with the idea of the Trinity. So that's where the idea of the Trinity came about. And now this is the official uh, belief of the Christians. Now what do you think happened to those people who didn't believe in the Trinity, who were, Christi who were Aslan Christians or they were Muslim basically? Okay. Exactly. So the Roman Emperor Constantine, he said anybody who doesn't believe in what we've just agreed on is basically not a Christian. Whoever says Esau was just a messenger, okay, and there's no, there's no Trinity, we're going to kill him. They're going to be killed. And of course there's groups, there's sects who actually believe in this at that time. And this is when eventually the Christian, and I'm, give, I'm giving a very brief history of you know, what's happened. We don't have enough time to go through everything, but it's very interesting. Those Christians who were, actu who were actual Christians, meaning they were Muslim, they were worshipping Allah, and they believed in Isa as a messenger of Allah, they had to flee. So some were massacred, some were killed, some managed to flee. Some monks and some priests, they managed to flee. And they went to different parts of uh, the world, but primarily they went to the Middle East and uh, around the, Tur the Turkic area, Turkmenistan, Tur Turkey, around that area. Okay? And Iran and those kinds of areas. So basically, away from the Roman Empire. So Iran at the time was Persia, Persian Empire. And Middle East wasn't, you know, run by the Romans at the time. And that's why, when we hear about the story of Salman al-Farsi, radiallahu an, he traveled to certain places, and he met monks, and their faith was not the faith of the mainstream Christianity of the Trinity, but their faith was that Isa a.s. was a messenger and that only uh, Allah should be worshipped. So if you all know the story of Salman, when he traveled for most of his life to different monks, and when one monk died, he would ask, before he died, he would ask him, where should I go now? You know, who, who, who can I go to to learn from about, about worshipping Allah? And so the monk would say, I don't know of anybody else who's on the same religion as me as us, which shows us they were, on a, they were on the original belief of the Christians, okay, of Tawheed. So the monk would tell them there's one person in this place, so very small, tiny pockets. And this is in the Middle East and also around, the, around Turkey and, and that area. This is where Salman al-Farsi was, was traveling. And then eventually, the, the last monk, he went to three different people and he st stayed with them. The last monk told him, go to a place which is green in Arabia. And he eventually ended up in Medina. And he's, he was told that there's going to be a messenger who's going to come because there's nobody on, on, the religion, uh, of, of this, on this religion of ours. Okay? Likewise, in Mecca, there were people who were Christian and they were worshipping Allah. They weren't worshipping Isa a.s. Like who? Yes, yeah, so there were Christians, specific Christians that we know of in Mecca who used to worship Allah Azza wa Waraqa ibn Nawfal, for example. Waraqa was the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha. And he was the one who the Prophet ﷺ went to and Khadija took him to Waraqa, her cousin, 
because he, he, he was somebody who worshipped Allah. And so he said, he said, if I was young enough, because he was very old at the time, he said, if I was young enough, I would help you and defend you and protect you when they throw you out of your own city. And he said, whatever's come to you, okay, Jibreel, this namus, this spirit that came to you is the same spirit that also came to Musa a.s. So he was a Christian. So the point being that he believed in the Prophet Muhammad a.s. and he understood this, this whole thing. The point being that there were Christians in the Middle East in this area. And there were other, there's other Christians as well who were there at the time. It's been documented in uh, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The point being that this is where basically Christianity changed. And up till today, this whole concept of the Trinity is still around, still exists. Now what's interesting is with regards to Isa Alaihi Salam and the Messenger of Allah Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, why is Islam unique and how is it unique as opposed to Judaism and Christianity? First of all, because Christianity and Judaism were religions that were for specific people at a specific time. So Bani Israel were sent many messengers and these messengers came with the Torah. So when Musa came with the Torah and the scriptures which came afterwards, for example, the, uh, the, the, the gospel that was given to Dawood okay, all of these prophets okay, were sent to Bani Israel, to the children of Israel, to basically teach them about how to worship Allah. Uh, but they were for specific periods of time, for specific people at specific times. Okay, and Judaism was for the children of Israel. Who is Israel, by the way? Very good. The father of Yusuf, Yaqub. So Yaqub is Israel. So when we say Bani Israel, it means the children of Yaqub. How many children did Yaqub have? Twelve. Yeah. Yusuf says, I, had, I saw a dream and I saw 11 stars. Those are his brothers. Don't forget him. He was the twelfth. So there were 12 sons. They married. They had many children. Eventually, they had, they had many wives and many children. And they, they were each considered to be a tribe. So there were 12, 12 tribes of Bani Israel. Okay, the point being that they were all given messengers and laws specific for their time. And that's why the message became corrupted over time. It never stayed the same. It was, never, it was never intended for those messages to stay the same until the end of time because it was for specific people at specific times. Whereas with Islam, Islam was something which was sent not just to the Arabs, but it was sent to the whole of the whole of the, the whole of the world, rahmatan lil alamin, to the whole of mankind, a mercy to the whole of mankind. So the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, was sent to the whole of mankind, and the laws of Islam are laws which are basically applicable today, a thousand years ago, five hundred years ago, five hundred years from now, until the end of time. And that's what makes Islam unique because that's actually a miracle for Islam to remain strong and consistent. And for people to continue to be worshipping Allah, okay, even up till today, 1400 years later, is a testament to the miracle of Islam and how Islam is, in fact, the truth. And if we look in the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam, there are so many miracles uh, which show us how Islam was, in fact, uh, the truth. For example, some very simple things, okay, that we learn from the seerah, very simple things like, how he started to call people to Islam uh, when he was in fact somebody who today would be considered old. So he was 40 years old when he started calling people to Islam. And there's wisdom in this, there's hikmah in this. Because if somebody started calling people to a new religion at the age of 20 years old, or at the age of 15 years old, or at the age of 25 years old, what kind of accusations would be thrown at him? Maybe you're young, you don't know what you're talking about. What else? You don't. Possibly. You made it up. Okay, you made it. Why would the person make it up at that age? Like they would say they think it's a messianic, they've done it's a 
Okay, possibly, but why, why would a 20 year old try to impress other people? What's, what, what? Attention, fame, wealth, power. When a person's 40 years old, okay, is he the same as when he's 20 years old? In any aspect? No, it's very different because you're settled. You, you know what you want to do in your life by the age of 40. You're settled, you're married. Most likely you, are, you have children, okay? People know you, you're respected in the community. If you're a righteous person, a good person, they know you, they know your history, they know your background, they know who you are, you've got experience, so on and so forth. And that's why the Messenger of Allah was called a Sadiq al Amin, the trustworthy one, the truthful one, the honest one, because they knew his reputation. So the fact that he called people to Islam at the age of 40 years old shows he actually didn't need anything from them and when they asked him he said even if you gave me the sun in one hand and the moon in the other i would never leave the worship of allah so the fact that he started calling people at the age of 40 in and of itself is proof it's evidence it shows us actually why what would make a person actually at that stage of his life risk everything risk his reputation and we know that's exactly what happened people instead of calling him a sadiq al-amin they started calling him the worst kinds of things, accusing him of the worst things. Madman, he's a sorcerer, he's a magician, he's this, he's that. So they started making things up. And he was less wealthy when he became a messenger. He was less wealthy when he became a messenger. His status in society, was it better or worse after he became a messenger? It was worse. For 13 years when he was in Mecca, it was worse. Now if somebody was doing it for power, or for status, or for fame, after a few days when he realizes it was a bad idea, I shouldn't have put that video up on YouTube, I'm not getting that many likes. What are they going to do? Take it off. Put out an apology. Say, no, 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 I, was, I, I tweeted it by mistake. You know, I said it was a mistake. I, I didn't mean to say those things. You know, my account was hacked and somebody else said it because they realized I made a big mistake. No one likes me anymore. Isn't it? But look at how 13 years, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, never ever changed his message. It was consistent all the way through. And then in Medina, 10 years, 23 years, nothing changed in terms of the core message of Tawheed. So this shows us, that's just one thing which shows us the proof of the prophethood of the Messenger of Allah uh, The brothers, they wanted me to talk about Islam from different perspectives. So in terms of one's spiritual, uh, you know, the spiritual side of Islam and how Islam benefits a person spiritually and how it benefits a person economically in terms of, you know, it being a way of life, it even affects his wealth, his money. And also in terms of politics and also in terms of the society and in terms of uh, the, the law as well. So. Uh, you've been sitting here very uh, nicely, quietly for the last 40 minutes. So I'm going to ask you, or the last half an hour. So now I'm going to ask you brothers, uh, how you think Islam benefits you spiritually. And then we can take it from there, we can discuss, okay, what you guys have to say about how you think Islam benefits you spiritually. Because we said Islam is something which is a way of life. It's a way of life. So it covers all aspects of our life. It's not just something which is physical. For example, Christianity has become so spiritual, the physical aspect of it is not really there anymore. So worship in Christianity is basically whatever you want to do. However you want to worship God, whatever your relationship with God is, as long as you know, you, you're happy, then it's fine. They don't have a specific way of worshiping God like we do. Okay? Judaism, on the other hand, the spirituality isn't there, but the physical laws are still there. The substantial laws, the laws of substance, for example, they have their own type of uh, laws with regards to halal food, sacrificing the animal and so on and so forth, kosher meat, and other things. Interestingly enough, just like us as Muslims, uh, the Jews, whenever they do something, traditional Jews, Whenever they do something, they start with the right side. And that's something that Muslims also do, which is interesting. And the point being that Jews actually have a physical side, but the spiritual side is lacking. So as Muslims, we encompass everything in terms of our 
our, our religion. So in terms of spirituality, what is it that Islam, uh, or how does Islam aid us and help us with regards to our spirituality? With regards to our faith and you know, our heart and... Connection. Connection with Allah. Okay, so how does, uh, how, how is that connection formed? In what way, in what, in what, by what means? Okay, by the five daily prayers. Okay, okay. So these are more kind of physical things. So, for example, the salah and, for example, remembering Allah. These are more physical things. What I'm looking for is spiritual things. Okay, okay. So, contentment is something which is basically in the heart. Yeah, when a person has uh, uh, shukr, when a person is, is grateful, Allah says, "La in shakartum, la azidannakum." So when acts of when you have acts of worship, you have acts of worship which are of the heart. So shukr, gratitude, is actually an act of worship. When you're thankful to Allah, Allah says, "If you are thankful, I will increase you." And that's why the scholars they say, when you're grateful to Allah for what you have, even if it's a very small amount. That's one of the ways that Allah will actually give you more. So normally when we, when we don't have much money or we don't have you know, nice things, we complain and we say, I don't have enough. Look at my friend or my neighbor or my cousin. They've got so much. You know, they've got much more money. They've got so many nice things. I don't have nothing compared. I don't have, you know, what I have is nothing compared to what they have. But actually when a person says, Alhamdulillah, I've, I have more than what some people have, and I've been blessed and you're thankful, actually Allah will increase you with what you, uh, with what you already have with even more. So showing gratitude, showing shukr and contentment. What other ways does Islam help one, one spiritually? In terms of his iman, in terms of his faith. Okay, so you know your goal, your purpose in life, so you have a sense of tama'nina. A sense of tranquility, a sense of peace, because you're not searching for the truth, because Allah's guided us and Allah's blessed us with the truth. So we're able to basically, uh, you know, feel this contentment and this and this sense of tranquility and peace. Anyone else? Okay, good. Taqwa, the fear of Allah, the fear of Allah. Okay, but how is that? How is that formed? How do you actually? Increase that taqwa. Okay, good. So possibly sincerity. Yeah, intention. When a person has the correct intention, then his deeds are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, with regards to spirituality, Islam is something which feeds the soul. It feeds the soul. Just like we need nourishment in terms of food to keep our body strong. Likewise, the soul, the soul also needs nourishment. Okay, because as Muslims, we understand that there is a soul. The body has a soul. Okay? Somebody who doesn't believe in God, we talked about God last week and atheism and you know, people who don't believe in God. Somebody who doesn't believe in God basically thinks that a human being is made up of atoms, blood, liquid, water, meat, skin, bones. That's it. There's no actual soul. But let's say somebody today made a replica of you and he looked exactly like you. He behaved exactly like you. He looked exactly like you. He thought exactly like you. He has the same likes and dislikes. And he behaves exactly the same way. He's like a cy cyborg from the future. Looks exactly like you. Okay, every single thing is exactly the same. Okay, when, you, when, when he's pinched, he feels pain, just like you, you feel pain. Okay, because he has nerves and receptors and, you know, lots of uh, wiring inside of him. Okay, a very advanced kind of robot who, you can't tell the difference. If you destroy this clone, this replica, is it the same as killing a human being? Why not? It's exactly the same thing. Because of the soul. It's, it's not the same thing. What's the difference? It's, it's exactly the same thing. 
his likes, dislikes, his feelings, his emotions, the way he behaves, the way he speaks, the way he walks, the way he talks, everything. Everything is exactly the same. So somebody who doesn't believe in God, okay, it would be a crime to kill that, to kill that clone, that replica. Okay, why is there any difference? But everyone understands human beings, there's something different about human beings, there's the soul inside of them. That's something which, you know, robots and so on don't have, they'll never be able to possess that soul. And that's why even in uh, Soviet Russia, like 50, 60 years ago, because they didn't believe in God, they were communists, they tried to experiment to try to create human beings. So they looked at what, are, what human beings are made up of. So they took all the ingredients of what made human beings, all the basic components, all the ingredients, all the different chemicals, and they tried to basically create a human being using those components because they didn't think there's, they have no concept of a soul. And obviously they, were, they weren't successful. But the point being, okay, that they had this idea in their minds. Okay, of trying to come up with something and it wasn't, it wasn't successful, it wasn't successful, it wasn't working. Because of course, the soul is something which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, the soul is blown into uh, the fetus when it's in the, in the womb. So that's how Islam is unique and Islam actually feeds the, the soul just as food and drink takes care of and feeds and gives strength to the body. And when a person doesn't have faith, when a person doesn't have Iman, when a person isn't a Muslim, his soul isn't being fed. And if it is being fed, it's being fed poison, it's being corrupted. Because whatever isn't being fed with the worship of Allah and Tawheed and the true purpose of someone, of why he's here, which is to worship Allah, anything else which he tries to feed his soul with, whether it's music, you know some people, they love music so much. It's like their life. They say, I can't live without music. Classical music is the most beautiful thing. Brings about peace and tranquility to the soul and so on and so forth. I feel at, at peace, I feel at ease. But what's happened is over time, okay, shaitan has basically corrupted them so much that it's become an addiction. They can't live without music now. Same thing with drugs, same thing with alcohol and so on and so forth. It becomes something which they're addicted to. It's something which they think it's helping them, but it's corrupting them, it's making them worse. It's making their condition worse. So, Islam is the only thing which actually feeds the soul and which actually gives contentment to the body. Anything else is basically corrupting the soul. You're not finding that true peace and true contentment. Even if you think it is giving you that true peace and contentment. Even if a person does say, I am at peace and I have this peace and tranquility. Okay, deep down, this individual doesn't have that because we know that only comes with the worship of Allah, which is your purpose in life. Uh, also, Islam and economics. Islam and finance. How does Islam dictate and aid us and guide us with regards to financial issues? How does Islam guide us in terms of financial issues, economics? Yes, zakah. How every single individual is required to pay zakah. Every adult, sane Muslim is required to pay 2.5% of zakah every single year and this benefits the economy and zakah isn't just on your money zakah is also on your your stock livestock or even stock of a business and that's different to the tax system today in this country and other countries so I could have I could have 10 houses that I own that's my property. And I might only have about 10,000 pounds in my bank. Okay, I might own houses, I might own land, I might own businesses. Okay, but in terms of substance, physical money, I'll only have about five or 10,000 pounds. So he only pays whatever it is, 18% or is it 20% now, tax. Something, yeah. So whatever it is, he only pays a fraction. Yeah, he only pays a fraction of that. So he owns possibly, you know, uh, uh, things which amount to maybe 10, 15, 20 million pounds property. 
and land and so on. But because physical money, okay, is a certain amount, he only pays tax on that money. And that's Islam from an Islamic perspective, that's something which is unjust. Okay, even from even from an un-Islamic perspective. It's unfair. It's unjust. And that's why today we have a problem where you have, you know, very rich people and very poor people. 90% of the wealth of the world belongs to under 10% of the population of the world. So 10% of people, okay, own 90% of the wealth of the whole world. Less than 10% in fact. In fact, I think it's actually less than 5%. So they own 90% of the wealth of the world. So for example, uh, the Rockefellers, a famous family in America, and uh, other famous families, the Kennedys for example, in America, and other people, they own so much wealth because they're involved in banks and so on and so forth, they own the banks, so they have so much wealth, so much money. So the, dis dis the, it's, it's, the disparity is huge between the wealthy and the poor. And actually Islam, not only through zakah, but also through general charity, encourages Muslims to give and to make sure the money is basically being reused, it's being cycled, you know, kind of recycled, or it's being, you know, feed it down through the communities, through society. Meaning, Islam doesn't encourage people to hoard their wealth. You know, a person is the richest man in the world, he owns 2 billion or 50 billion or 100 billion, and he's not doing anything with it, he's just keeping it, just mounting and collecting all that wealth. Islamically, actually, it's, it's something which encourages a person to give his wealth, so that people can benefit. And so that's actually another way of zakah, and also general charity is another way of a person benefiting uh, from Islam in terms of wealth, in terms of the economy. And also even in terms of <coughs> uh, battles and conquests. So we know when nations and, and people invaded other countries and other lands, what would the soldiers and what would the armies do when they went into that, those lands and they went into homes or shops or whatever? They would ruin it if there, was, if there were valuables. They would take it. That's, that's the norm. That's common. Okay, in the Middle East, when they attacked Iraq, they took the gold and they took the oil and so on and so forth, and other places as well. Okay, even the Second World War. Okay, the soldiers, when they went to uh, Germany and they saw, uh, they went into the, the, the Nazi headquarters and they saw how comfortably they were living and the wine and the jewelry and, and the valuables they had in those places, the pictures, the works of art on the walls, they took all of those things, even though they never belonged to them, they stole basically. Islamically, if an, uh, a Muslim army okay, attacks a land, they're not allowed to take anything that belongs to somebody else. You're actually not allowed to, which is, you know, the opposite of what people generally do. So to that extent where basically Islamically, okay, you can't actually, uh, you know, take the wealth of someone, even if you're attacking them. Booty is, war booty is basically when you attack the enemy and whatever the enemy possesses in terms of weapons and uh, things like this, that you can take, that's permissible. And that's only something which is permissible for the Prophet Muhammad's ummah. But before this it was impermissible. Yeah, so if you fight in the army, whatever the army leaves behind in terms of weapons and whatever they have. So that's different. Those who are attacking you, those who are fighting you. Okay, it doesn't mean you go into someone's house and say, yeah, war booty, I'm taking some, some of your stuff now. Okay. So Islam also helps and aids the economy, okay? And Islam provides us with uh, guidelines about how we can improve and how we can keep a stable economy which benefits everybody. And also uh, riba being impermissible, which helps us, okay? And it benefits those who are poorer, those who are less uh, successful financially. Islam and politics, in terms of you know, the, the political sphere, Islam is something which encourages uh, people to help others at a national level. And that's done by giving legislations. 
And we know, for example, Ali radiallahu an was a politician. And he was a judge. And he was somebody who was very intelligent and very, very smart. And he was a, a warrior on the battlefield as well. He was somebody who was a politician. But when we think of politician, we think of people who commit sins and they lie and they, you know, uh, break their agreements and promises and so on and so forth. But the, the righteous Muslim, when he's involved in politics and helping individuals, he's basically serving the community. And that's the whole, uh, you know, role behind the politician in the first place. The politician is there to serve the people. He's helping the people. And if you look at Umar radiallahu anhu, when he was a leader, okay, he would say himself, he would say, if a donkey stumbled in the forest lands of the Islamic empire, I would feel like I, was, I would be punished by Allah on the day of judgment as a result of you know, that donkey stumbling, stumbling because the land wasn't safe and the land wasn't stable and the land wasn't you know, smooth. And it was, a rocky, it was a rocky path. I would feel responsible because of that donkey stumbling and tripping. So he felt a responsibility. And that's the whole idea behind Islam and politics, helping individuals, helping others, and benefiting the society at large. And also Islam and the society. You know, Islam uh, encourages people to help the society. How does Islam encourage people to help the society? How does Islam tell us to help societies as a whole, to help communities? Muslim or non-Muslim. Okay, sadaqa, charity. What else? Don't the neighbors have rights? Neighbors have rights. That's, that's, that's societal, isn't it? That's your community. Neighbors have rights regardless if they're Muslim or non-Muslim. Neighbors have rights. Okay, people have rights. So, you know, even on a societal level, Islam encourages people to work with one another. Allah says, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Work with one another in that which is right. And with those who have taqwa. You know, with, with those who, have, uh, who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So working with others for things which are going to benefit the people is something which Islam encourages. Regardless of if they're Muslim or not. And this is why the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam he was somebody who agreed with a pact which was made by the Quraysh before Islam where they would help anybody who came to Mecca and he was being oppressed by somebody in Mecca. An incident took place where somebody was being oppressed, he wasn't given his money by somebody living in Mecca and they made this pact, it was called Hilf al-Fudul, this agreement, this oath that they made and they included all the tribes in Mecca. And the Messenger of Allah was actually part of this hilf as well. He agreed and he made a, he, he contributed and he was part of this pact. Where they agreed, anybody who is suffering, anybody who's being oppressed, anybody whose rights aren't being met in Mecca, we will all unite and we'll force this person in Mecca, whoever he is, whichever tribe he's from, it doesn't make a difference, to basically uh, do whatever he was supposed to do, give back the money or, you know, uh, be just to that individual that he oppressed. So much so, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, or later when he became a messenger, he said, if those people of Mecca came up with a similar pact, a similar hilf, like they did before, I would be the first to sign it, I would be the first to agree to it. So again, this shows us how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would help and want to uh, help others and work with others in terms of general good. Also in the, from the legal perspective. So Islam has a court system. You have a judge. And you know, many non-Muslims, because of the media today, they think that Islam is a religion where the law is in the person's hands. And if someone steals something, that's it. You, there and then you just cut their hands off. You know, somebody does something, uh, somebody commits a crime, straight away you just cut their heads off, that's it. It's like crazy, craziness on the streets of Muslim countries. It's like, you know, vigilantes. But actually what's, and, and subhanAllah, you see this in, 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 on TV and in the media as well. I remember uh, I watched a long time ago uh, the animated movie, Aladdin. And in that film, the woman takes some fruit to give to a child and the guard is there in the marketplace and he grabs her hand and he says, he takes his sword out 
And he says, do you know the punishment for stealing? And he's about to chop, it, chop her hand off and then she's saved by somebody. SubhanAllah, that's like, the basic saying Islam is, this is how it works in Islam, this is what happens. Like someone, someone's poor and he steals money or she, she, she steals like some food for somebody who's poor and straight away they're just, their hands are chopped off there and then. Whereas actually, if somebody does steal because of poverty, nothing happens. They're not held to account. There's no punishment because the, the, the leader at the time is responsible for people, taking care of people's needs. The point being, from a legal perspective, there's a court system. You have a judge, okay, who has to, have, who has to meet certain conditions and he's the one who decides. So, all of these things that we've mentioned, brothers and sisters, should give us an idea about how Islam is something which isn't specific to just acts of worship that we do in the masjid. It's much more than this. You have the rights of Allah and then you have the rights of human beings as well. You have huquq al-ibad. And huquq al-ibad could be the rights of our family members or could be the rights of Muslims, but it could also be the rights of non-Muslims. And that's something we really need to learn. We really need to understand how Islam is, is a religion which doesn't just talk about acts of worship like reading Quran and praying and fasting and so on. But it's about how we live our lives and how we behave with others. <laughs> and that's something which we need to think about and some, something we need to reflect on inshallah uh, in our lives and how much of Islam do we embody on a day-to-day -day basis. Because nowadays, you know, when we're at work, we're less Muslim than we are if we were at home. You know, we're not as Muslim. We're more Muslim at home, we're really Muslim at home, really Islamic at home. When we're at work, we're not so Islamic. Things kind of start to change. Okay, and that's a problem with identity. It's an identity problem. When we're in the masjid, we're even more Islamic. You're the most Islamic when you're in the masjid. When you're at home, yeah, you relax a little bit. When you're at work, then you kind of, you know, it decreases even more. So it's something which affects our identity. We need to think about you know, who we are as Muslims living here and how we benefit others and that's from Islam. So it's not a case of suppressing Islam, it's a case of showing Islam in the best way, in the most appropriate way, to the right, you know, in the right way to specific people and benefiting others inshallah. So it's something we need to think about uh, in terms of our own lives and how we can improve on ourselves, you know, how, what role can we play in terms of contributing to making others aware, more aware of the true message of Islam and so on and so forth. Uh, if there's any questions, then I'll do my best to answer them, inshallah. Yes, so Dawood salam, he was given the Psalms, he was given the Zabur, yes. And Dawood was from, was from Bani, he was from the offspring of uh, Ishaq alayhi salam. Yeah, so Yaqub alayhi salam gave birth to Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf alayhi salam gave birth to? Who did Yusuf alayhi salam give birth to? Or from the offspring of Yaqub alayhi salam. So you had, so who was the grandfather of Yusuf alayhi salam? Ishaq. And who was Ishaq's father? Ibrahim. So the whole line of prophets and messengers after Ishaq or after Ibrahim alayhi salam through Ishaq were all sent to Bani Israel, including Dawood alayhi salam. And uh, they took, uh, this would require more research, so I'm not you know, entirely sure of the specific details, but they took some beliefs of Dawood from the Gospel, uh, but in terms of uh, their beliefs, it's different to the Christians because the Christians actually uh, have the Gospel which they actually follow. So the Christians are closer to the Gospel than the Jews are. So the Christians actually uh, even the gospel themselves, they sing the gospel. The gospel is actually the, the words, yes. No, the gospel was a book which was given to Dawood and it was given to Dawood uh, to tell the people how to worship Allah at his time. 
So what's left of it is what the Christians have. And what the Christians have isn't the same as what Dawood had from the Gospel, from the Psalms. Yeah, from the, from, from the, the, the Psalms. No, the, I'm getting mixed up now. The, yeah, the, the Zabur was the Psalms, so I'm getting mixed up. Yeah, so, so whatever he was given, the Jews and the Christians took parts of it, but because it was something which was given to a specific society, to a specific community, it wasn't, it wasn't kept as time went on. Yeah. Music is something which isn't permissible because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about music uh, in the Quran and he mentions uh, those things uh, which are from idle talk, from vain talk. And I don't remember the ayah specifically, but Ibn Abbas and also Ibn Mas'ud, they said, by Allah, by the one who has my soul in his hand, this is referring to music. So the companions themselves, they said this is referring to music. And also the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, uh, from the signs of the Day of Judgment, is that music will become more prevalent. People will permit music. It will be something which will be permissible. Muslims will start to use music. So these things, they show us that music is something, and that's a whole other lecture. You know, talk, talking about music and the harmful effects of music. You know, when you listen to music, when you listen, when you listen to songs and you listen to music, it just takes you once to listen to them and you never forget those lyrics, those, those words. Yes, yeah, so we have to differentiate between music and songs. What is music? Instruments. So stringed, stringed in instruments and wind instruments. That's what's considered to be music. And that's why in, in time of the companions, they would use the, the duff. So the duff is permissible to use in Islam. But the stringed and wind, uh, the stringed and wind instruments, which is basically all the other instruments, aren't permissible in Islam. And songs, again, for example, anashid. Okay, this is a whole other topic, so I don't want to go into too much detail. But anashid, generally speaking, is permissible as long as it doesn't have music in them. It's permissible as long as they don't have things in them which are haram, and they don't have acts of, you know, things which are in, 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 innovations or things which you know are, are, are polytheistic in nature in terms of committing shirk and so on and so forth and going overboard and going excessive then it's something which isn't going to, is, is permissible as long as it doesn't have those things yeah so obviously that's, that's a whole different uh, thing but you know generally speaking uh, the best thing to listen to is the Quran that's personal, my personal advice I don't personally listen to Nashid because not because I don't think it's permissible but Quran, Quran is something which simply listen to the Quran you're, you're getting reward you're benefiting from listening to you're being rewarded for listening to the Quran. When the Quran is being recited, then uh, remain quiet and listen to it so that you'll be shown mercy. So just listening to the Quran, Allah will show you mercy. Mercy will come your way. Allah's mercy will come your way just because you listen to the Quran. And that you don't get that with anything else, even in Ashid. So Allah knows best. Exactly, that's the best food for the soul. Better than anything else. One more question, inshallah. Any more questions? Um, you know, we have some amongst uh, Muslims who um, uh, do certain things to uplift their spirits for the soul. Like, for example, they have uh, organized uh, hadras and, uh, and things 
organized sittings, gatherings. So, so generally speaking, generally speaking, when it comes to uh, gatherings, then uh, the Messenger of Allah he said that no people gather together remembering Allah, except that the angels surround them and mercy envelops them, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions them with those who are around Him, meaning He mentions them to the angels. So gatherings of knowledge and gatherings where Allah is remembered is something which is encouraged. But at the same time, when you're remembering Allah, it's an act of worship. And acts of worship, the ruling of acts of worship is that everything with regards to worshipping Allah, the basic principle, the rule number one, with regards to worshipping Allah is that everything is haram. Except for that which Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have told us about worship. So if something is being done in a gathering which isn't mentioned in the Quran or in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and it wasn't done, then that's something which can't be permissible. Because if, if you do think it's permissible, then you're basically saying, I know something about Islam which they didn't know. I know a way to worship Allah which they didn't know. When it's actually the opposite. They know much more about ibadah and worship than we do. So that's the basic principle with worship. So acts of worship, we can't worship however we want to, isn't it? You can't come to the masjid and just start spinning around and saying, yeah, I'm worshipping Allah. You can't do that because you use specific ways to worship Allah. So that's always the basic principle. If there's no evidence for it, then you don't accept it. Okay, inshallah, jazakumullah khair. Uh, we're going to be continuing next Sunday, inshallah. And... Uh, the topic for uh, next week's uh, lecture, obviously we're going to be covering the common uh, misconceptions uh, that people have about Islam, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. And next week is going to be about the Sharia and capital punishment. I think it's, um, human and okay, it keeps on changing. I don't even know what's going on. I was sent this a couple of, day, a couple of days ago. Okay, so it's on... Okay. Okay, so next week is going to be on human rights, human rights and slavery. Yeah, so we'll talk about human rights and slavery next week, inshallah, from an Islamic perspective. Oh, sorry. Okay, one more question, inshallah. So the uh, question is, which is, what is the best way to feed our soul with good content? So... Uh, when we talk about feeding the soul, it's basically worship. So worshipping Allah. So what are the ways we can worship Allah through the heart? By having love for Allah, by having fear of Allah, by having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and Him responding to your du'as, by having gratitude towards Allah, all of these things which are not things that you do physically. So all of these acts of worship are all done in the heart. And the more you do these, the more gratitude you show, the more love you show for Allah by doing more acts of worship and by learning about the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that increases this love. The more you learn about the hellfire and the punishments of Allah on the people who came before, that increases your fear. All these things will, will help uh, a person in terms of his soul. So inshallah we'll continue next week.